I remember back in the 60s, about 67 or 68, some of you, some of you can remember that. There was a dirge-like song. You think of a funeral dirge, it's a very sad, a lot of times in a minor key sound. But it was entitled, Who Will Answer? Who Will Answer? And you must remember your history a little bit, what was going on at that time, because the hippie movement was moving at its height, and the Vietnam War was going lickety-split. If you don't know what lickety-split is, there's a Greek lexicon you can look it up in. You know about as much after you've read it than that you did before you went to it. But there was all sorts of protests by the hippies and other war protesters. And it was on the news every day, in the newspapers. All such stuff is that. And I think this song, from what I remember of it, was pretty much written by one of those hippie characters. And they were saying, who's going to answer for all this? But you know, that's a good question. Who will answer? Who will answer? To Job, God said, Gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Job 38 and verse 3. You'll remember that Job would not admit that he had sinned because he hadn't. And his three so-called friends said, Now you wouldn't be going through this mess if you hadn't sinned and you're just not confessing it. Well, they were wrong. Good people, righteous people suffer. They don't deserve it because wicked things are in this world and that can inflict them. But Job would say, if I just had a chance to talk to God, I would ask Him questions and basically demand of Him what's going on here. Well, when you open up Job 38, when the opportunity comes for both of them to talk directly to one another, guess who asked the questions? And guess who could not answer? That's the way it would be with a lot of us. And you have then Job 38, 3, God's statement, gird up thy loins like a man. Play the man, be a man, stand up here and, you know, face the music. For I will demand of thee and answer thou me. So there follows a host of questions from God to Job. And they're designed to make him ponder. You know, a lot of questions, you're not just after an answer. You're trying to get people to use that mind to think and to conclude certain matters they hadn't thought about before. In fact, a lot of times it's called, going back that far, the Socratic method because that's the way Socrates taught. He taught by questions. But of course, Job couldn't answer. And there are a lot of those kinds of questions from God to which men cannot reply. And even if he could come up with the answer, <laughs> he might plead the Fifth Amendment to keep from incriminating himself. But I thought when I saw this song, but who will answer, remembered it. I thought there are a lot of questions that will help us. And I'm deviating from our regular series that we've been in for some time for the reasons I gave the church a long time ago that I'm delivering this series under the Word of Reconciliation. Well, this is the first Lord's Day of a new year. Maybe it would do us well then to say, who will answer or what will I answer when it comes to God and the way I think, the way I speak, the way I live? I will have to answer someday. You remember as Paul wrote to the church in Rome, toward the end of that epistle in Romans 14, he says, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. And then in verse 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That's a pretty serious matter, isn't it? If the world ended right now, there would be a great judgment. A full and complete and final judgment. And this would take place for you and for me and for all those who are responsible to God for their actions. That is, they are accountable to God. So that every one of us, nobody left out, 
shall give account of himself to God. Explicitly in just so many words or implicitly. That's what the whole matter implies. We're taught that that's what we're going to do. There's no escaping it. In fact, we pointed out in closing the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 12, or rather 13, verse 17, that we're taught as the church, obey them that have the rule over you, and that would be the elders, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. And then it says, of the elders regarding their shepherding of the, of the flock as they that must. It's imperative. They can't get away with it. They can't dodge. They must give account. That they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that's a profit for you. You see, everything God obligates us to do, we must give account to God someday regarding it. All the people out here say there is no God. They'll give an account to God for that. The people who say, well, you're saved by faith only, be what the Bible teaches, they're going to give an account for that. Right on down from the repentance that's demanded in becoming a Christian, following belief in Christ based on the testimony of the Scriptures that prove He's the Son of God, what it means to repent in the plan of salvation, the confession of one's faith, what that means in a person's life as to why he would stand up publicly and confess Jesus to be the Son of God. Those who have never been baptized but believe in Jesus Christ, they're going to give an account why they didn't. When the Scripture says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. They're going to give an account of the way they lived in the church. You know, this is the beginning of, of a new year. How often do you pray? Is it ever taught in the Bible that Christians should pray quite often? Does the Bible teach us how to pray? Does it teach us what we should conclude in that prayer? Does it teach us the attitude we should have when we approach the Father? What about worship? Does it teach us we must worship God in spirit and in truth? And do we ascertain from the New Testament of the Christ the acts of worship in which we're to engage, we're going to give an answer someday. There's no escaping it. You see, that's in your Bible if you never knew I existed or I didn't exist. It's just that. Well, I'm just, I'm just telling you what's in your Bible. Very fundamental, isn't it? What about when it comes um, to studying the Bible? Just a few days of this year, have you not read it yet? Except maybe when we gather publicly. <coughs> How long have you been a member of the church? And you still have to be goaded into studying the Bible, which means you still have to be goaded to listen to God speak to you. You're very Savior in His last will and testament, but you some way get around to do all these important matters. I'm going to preach a sermon here, not too, Lord willing, distant future on eternity. Now you're going to have to wonder what I'm going to say, but I'm going to preach on eternity. I didn't say, although you might think so, that I would preach for eternity. But I'm going to preach a sermon on eternity. And when I do that, I'm going to preach a sermon on time. Because they both go hand in hand. But all these fundamental matters, first principle, that a person dedicated to God, according to Matthew 6.33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things should be added to you. Have you really studied your Bible yet this year? Why? Talk about resolutions, which were mentioned on Wednesday night. If you're going to make New Year's resolutions, don't you think you should resolve to study the Bible daily? What about preparing to give of your means? We had a lesson on that here recently. Are we really giving of our means as we've been prospered? Are we really cheerful to give? For well, God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't want us to be grudged because, well, I have to do it, so I've got to do it. That's, might as well not give if you're going to have that attitude. Who's going to answer for those things? What will ye do in the end thereof? Now, that might be said to be a loaded question. And it was through the prophet, the weeping prophet Jeremiah, that God asked that question. In Jeremiah 5, verse 31, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And then the question, and what will you do in the end thereof? You know, at that time, Jerusalem was about to be destroyed because of its apostasy. Jeremiah was working and suffering because he preached what needed to be preached, and they didn't want to hear it. They had undergone a situation for a good while of 
a corrupt and reprobate combination of prophets and priests. They were leading a degenerate people who were well pleased with their chosen profession, and that was to be depraved. They had just what they wanted, and they weren't really seeking a true prophet that might disturb the, shall we say, status quo of spiritual, their own personal spiritual degradation. Isaiah also spake of this evil when the great messianic prophet said that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speaking to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Isaiah 39 through 11. Uh, people really changed. And this was speaking to the people of God. Here was a condition where people had rather hear preachers preach lies. Than to hear truths that were very unpleasant. And caused them to be very upset. Because frankly they knew they weren't living like the law of Moses said. They didn't want to be right. They didn't want to be right. In fact, what they wanted was to be left alone in their love of false teaching. And so the question, what will you do in the end thereof? So how typical of these days when multitudes are lulled into complacency and lethargy. And they're put to sleep by these false teachers, religious racketeers. And the one who speaks the truth without apology. Is considered some sort of crazy person. You know, a person can be away from the pure truth on anything, but especially spiritual truth, so long that when they finally hear the truth, they're startled. They're absolutely amazed. It sounds so strange. They think that person's mad. Well, what can be done to awaken people to the real dangers of eternal hell fire? How can we get people to give up their lip service to religious forms and rituals? To quit turning a deaf ear to God's Word? Well, it's going to begin with the people of God themselves not being found guilty of that. While they content that they, and they probably do, feel perfectly all right. And they beguile themselves and saying, well, I'm honest and sincere, so what difference does it make what I believe? Uh, I know I'm directing it to God in my own mind, so He'll receive it. You know, that's handled right in the beginning of the Bible with Cain. Cain worshipped God. Cain sacrificed in worshiping God. It was rejected. Why? Because he didn't do what God said do in the way God said do it and for the reason or reason God said do it. And Hebrews 11 and 4, that great chapter on faith, makes it very clear that by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith means, since faith comes by hearing the word of God, Abel understood when he heard the word of God what was required of him, and he didn't deviate from it. Cain did. But nevertheless, he worshipped. So you can intend to worship God, but if it's not by his authorized will, what good will it do? And, and, and what are those people going to do when they have to answer for it? I want you to think of these words. You know them if you're a student of the Bible. There is a way that seemeth right to a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, 1 and 2. After a person has trusted in man rather than God, and that goes on all the time, after one has obeyed something else or somebody else rather than God, and after they have worshipped and served, even in the Lord's church, according to their own will, then who do you think is going to have to answer? And what will they do in the end thereof? Well, a question that is pertinent, to especially this materialistic generation, was prompted by our Lord Himself. In Mark 8, 36 through 37, we touched on this sometime back, and you've heard many sermons preached on it. For what shall it profit a man 
if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Does that need explanation? Do we not understand it? If you could balance the whole world on one side and one soul on the other, toward which would the scale incline as to worth and value? To gain the whole world might assure greatness in time as far as the world's definition of greatness. And it might also afford pleasure. Although I think a lot of folks seeking after that find that when they get some part of it, it's not very pleasurable. I often think, because I'm a student of history, about Hitler and all of those in the head of the Nazi party when they were in their heyday before World War II started, but quickly thereafter it began to decline, how they were, so to speak, on top of the world. But then I remember Hitler in those last days in the bunker. There's no pleasure there. No peace of mind. And that's the thing people don't think about. The only certain thing about the fellow who lives for this present world the only certain thing, I say, is uncertainty. It can fly on wings in a very swift departure. And while whatever we have materially, earthly gain, it can only give comfort for fleeting duration. It does not, in most people, give any satisfaction you can't take it with you. Everybody leaves this world just like everybody came into it without anything but their own body coming into it and they don't even have that leaving it. Now, who will answer? Each one of us. Well, then a soul-searching question which every unsaved person should seriously and soberly contemplate and yet be unable to answer is found in the Hebrews epistle chapter 2 and verse 3. And he's writing to Christians here. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now, you know, this question is not how shall we escape if we openly defy God, rebel against Christ, throw the Bible out the window, deny that it's inspired of God and the Word of God, blaspheme against all that is high and holy. Some people think that's what it takes to be lost. It's just not so. I guess we think Ananias Sapphira, the first sinners in the early church, must have just renounced everything there was about Christianity. Nothing in the Bible indicates that. They just simply broke God's law deliberately and purposely, one component part of it. And how did God treat them? Well, you know the answer. So you don't have to rise up against God and open defiance, deny His existence, and so forth. Every person stands in need of redemption for all of sin to come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, separation from God, Romans 6.23. It's only through the salvation which God extends through Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, that we have hope to escape, an expectation, in other words, to escape. Paul makes that clear in 2 Timothy 2.10 to Timothy. How shall we escape if we neglect that salvation? Well, remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14.6. And Peter, we may say, settled the question. At least in part by saying, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 After God has given His only begotten Son, and that Son has given His life, then the question, How shall we escape? if we neglect so great salvation. 
but who will answer? A question that confronts those who have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ is set out by the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. Now he's talking about more specifically in this whole chapter how that the Jewish Christians would escape the destruction of Jerusalem, but there's a principle here. Listen in verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? Now he goes ahead and develops that further, but he does apply it both ways. If you're not faithful, you're going to miss the guidelines of getting out from the destruction of Jerusalem. But in this case, how is it that the church of the living God, purchased by the blood of Christ, the faith, those faithful in it to the Lord, how are they say, Well, folks, if it wasn't for the blood of Christ and their trust in His gospel, the power of God to save, they wouldn't be, would they? How many are like that on the earth right now? That have fully from the heart obeyed the gospel and are living righteous lives in the church? A very few. Well, to find the end of this, that is, the end of such people. All you've got to do is look at 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7. Paul says unto you who are troubled, troubled, persecuted for righteousness' sake, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now what's going to happen to them? who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Our question, who will answer? Jesus has set obedience as a requisite of salvation. People who teach that you can be saved by Christ and not render obedience to His gospel are lying through their teeth. Do you mean to say that they know they're lying? Oh, I don't know that they know. But you don't have to know you're lying to propagate a lie. And who will answer? Blessed are they, Revelation twenty two fourteen. 14. Blessed are they that do His commandments. That they may have right to the tree of life and enter into the, and through the gates into the city. And Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament and this is just before inspiration laid down its great pen forevermore. But back in Ecclesiastes 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. So you go back to the Old Testament, you come down to the end of the inspired volume. The last word in God's book concerns salvation and being obedient to God in order to receive it. Well, the last one is, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? I think we've answered that, haven't we? This is where it goes somewhat into those who are Christians having paid attention to the guidelines that were given so they could escape the destruction of Jerusalem. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? First Peter 4, 18. I, I know anybody that's saved not scarcely saved. You're just saved or not saved. If you're faithful to the Lord, having obeyed the gospel of God's power to save you and being baptized to Christ, then you're not scarcely saved. You're saved. This tends to be talking about barely getting out of Jerusalem. And if that's you, what's going to happen to those who didn't pay attention to those guidelines Jesus gave in Matthew 24? But the point is, go back to that day and time. They're Christians. They're Jews in Jerusalem, but they're Christians. The Lord gave them the signs that would appear for them to be able to escape the destruction of Jerusalem through the armies of Rome under Titus. What if they had listened? They heard it spoken. They heard it taught in Bible class. But they just nonchalant. You mean people would actually be like that? <laughs> They're all around us today, aren't they? And they might not have gotten out. And no doubt some didn't. 
When you think about when you read your Bible, the trials, the persecutions, and all of the afflictions, because they loved God and kept His commandments and told them the way of eternal life. When you think about, well, Paul in particular, but their, their unflagging zeal and labor and their endurance, does that make us want to set up and take notice about any moment my life can be over? Any moment. You can take a breath and you can be dead not knowing anything in this world before you exhale it or as you exhale it. We have in our minds sometimes conjured up about ourselves getting sick and laying in the bed and gradually leaving this earth and uttering sweet things just before we believe our last. You know, that's kind of rare. <laughs> but we should try to write things here since people make these resolutions at the beginning of the new year. At least some do. Let us resolve to be able to answer according to the will of God that we might hear our Lord's own statement to us on the day of judgment, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye in to the gates, into the holy city. And as he said, otherwise, the place prepared for those that love the Lord from the foundation of the world. Who will answer? Well, the truth of the matter is, is right where it was when we started. Each one of us shall give account of our life to God. This old world gets the same. It doesn't change. It just gets more burdens. I, I know not to expect anything any different than what always has been. Maybe worse than it is now, but it'll be the same thing. And there must be something that's missing because when I read my New Testament of godly people, they long for their long home. I don't know how a person can grow in the knowledge of the will of heaven and mature spiritually and not want out of this world. I just don't understand it. Beyond the glow of the sunrise, Beyond the morning star. On past the blue of the azure skies. There's a gate of pearl ajar. Beyond the glow of the northern lights. Above the milky way. On past the twinkling stars of night. There's a land of endless day. And on beyond the night's despair, beyond this world's grim strife, beyond the weight of pain and care, there awaits another life. And therefore, I'll look beyond the cares that plague this world I roam. I resolutely climb those stairs that on beyond reach home. Do you ever just get tired of the same old thing over and over again. Doesn't mean your zeal is flagging. It's just that you know from your knowledge of the Bible and applying it all your life. It's never going to get any different. And a lot of times a whole lot worse. Now who will answer when they have the opportunity to prepare themselves to meet their God and they didn't do it. Who will answer in the church when back in their background they obeyed the gospel and they were added to the church by the Lord. But the affairs of this world still occupies their mind more than the affairs of the kingdom of heaven. Well, you must answer that. I can as God searches your mind and knows all things. What will the remainder, if this year goes by, be for you in your service to the king? What will you take with you out of this lesson? Who will answer? If you're not a child of God, we've studied this morning how to become one. It's the greatest thing you can become and then greater to live faithful in the church. 
If you haven't obeyed the gospel, would you obey it this morning from the heart to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins? Acts 2.38 and Galatians 3.26 and 27. Then to live faithful in the spiritual body of Christ, the church, the family of God, the kingdom of heaven, doing all you can to fill your mind with the knowledge of the Lord and what it is to live for the Lord and seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, knowing all these things shall be added unto you, Matthew 6.33. If you've erred as a child of God, you need to repent of those sins and God's second law of pardon, confessing whatever they are, and praying God for forgiveness. The invitation is now offered, and what will you do in the end thereof? Will you come to Jesus while we stand and sing?